Are you still getting used to putting a new number on either in your checks or a calendar or something? Now, thankfully, this is one of the good things about yes. teaching at Southern is that Gordon and Ben, maybe it's this way with you, when you've been at an institution for a while, your, your body kind of gets used to the rhythms of, of the school calendar. And it is nice that school hasn't quite started yet, so a few extra days to get accustomed to the year. So school starts this coming Monday, so a number of students will be returning tomorrow, although there were a couple of looking around in the religion building yesterday just to spot out their classroom. Some of those students want to make sure they know where to go. They're transferring in from uh, California to this is their first semester at Southern starting this, this coming semester. So we're glad to welcome them to campus. A little food for thought before we have a prayer to begin our class. I thought this was memorable. This gift may not be worth much to you, but it cost me everything. Uh -huh. Message on a Christmas card. And then there's one that quote from J.I. Packer, who wrote the classic book, Knowing God. And, and in fact, this would be a good theme quote for our, our study of the life of Christ, because the life of Christ involves the incarnation. But isn't this true? The more you think about it, the more staggering it gets. Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as is this truth of the incarnation. Amen. Isn't that right? Amen. We're thinking about it. And, uh, so, Bob, thank you for leading us back to our, our study of the life of Christ. And we'll, we'll be taking up a couple of scenes in connection with that life of Christ. Just for our a focus on our prayer at the beginning of our lesson, yes, we do have a new year, 2024. <laughs> but actually, uh, isn't it true that we're left with the same brokenness in the world? And I don't want to, the year, year is off to a good start. I'm happy for you and uh, a blessed new year to you. But in a way for... For me, it is epitomized. There are actually two funerals, memorial services this afternoon scheduled at the same time. One in the Collegedale Community Church, one in the Collegedale Church by individuals that are both friends of, of my family. One of them involves the, the loss of somebody's seven-year-old daughter. And I have another colleague who's been trying to relieve his brother, his sister-in-law's in the hospital with bilateral pneumonia. She's uh, quadriplegic and, and doesn't even have the ability to cough on her own. And then another dear friend, her, her mother is in the process of passing away. And, and my wife used the term a tsunami. Isn't that what it seems like sometimes? So, I just want to reflect back. Like I said, I, I don't. I'm not out to give your new year a bad start, but but it is true. We have the same brokenness in this world, and Scripture speaks about that, doesn't it? Romans eight. We know that the whole creation has been what? Sometimes those groans are rather loud, aren't they? When Mary and I went to the visitation yesterday afternoon for two of our graduates from our theology program, Jeremy Wong, the family life pastor at the McDonald Brook Church, and Brooke Durst Wong, his wife, stood there next to the casket with their seven-year-old. It, it, it brings you anguish inside. Most of us here are parents or grandparents, or it, it hurts. And I just would remind us today, and of course, this is what the life of Christ is about, is our only hope is the renewal and restoration promised by God in Scripture. As someone said, Jesus, this is the last best hope for this planet. And so while there are times that in our lives that, that we take one day at a time, right? We take one day at a time. We hold on to the hope that God provides, the hope of renewal and restoration. The one who said, Behold, I make all things new. So my hope is that 
even these sad events, which we reference, that, that it will give us a deeper longing and more fervent anticipation for that time when God makes all things new. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, as we take up this study, the life of Christ today, this first Sabbath of the new year, may we recognize how staggering the truth is that, that God with us, Jesus, Emmanuel, came to this earth to live and die for us. We praise you today. We, we will praise you throughout eternity. We ask that you will draw near to the brokenhearted in a special way today. Comfort them with, with the comfort that only you can give. And imbue in them the hope of renewal and restoration. Give us that same hope today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I have entitled our study today, Two Memorable Journeys. I was looking for something. Uh, Bob gave me a good, good assignment today. We're dealing with Matthew chapter 2. And then some selections from Luke chapter 2. And I was thinking, what, what ties these stories together? And you can see the picture on the top, the visit of the wise men. Now let's think about that just a moment. Some of us began, uh, can, can remember early in life, singing the song, We Three what? Kings of Orientar. But the truth is, the Bible doesn't tell us there were kings doesn't tell us how many there were. And while it does tell us they came from the east, which is the meaning of the term Orient, we don't know exactly where it was from, was it from Persia. Somebody even suggested, did they come from as far as China? We don't know. But, you know, it wouldn't make a very good song, would it, to say, let's see, we people of unknown status in life of indeterminate number, that doesn't make a very good song, does it? <laughs> But, but it is good to realize maybe how much of this is bound up with tradition, and we want to examine the verses in Scripture. By the way, uh, artists and, and those who have painted biblical scenes down through history, they've given us many images of the three wise men. Have you ever noticed how, how nicely dressed they are? And what is it, the uh, Lululemon or Ralph Lauren would be, would be happy to claim that. I'm not sure if they're going on a long journey, if they're riding on camels, or they dress that nicely. But anyway, we, we three kings of Orient are, we're going to talk about that. And then we will turn to the scene of the boy Jesus at the temple when his parents went up to Jerusalem at age 12. So I thought about this, and what ties this together is two memorable journeys. So let's take our Bibles. Turn to Matthew 2. Want to welcome also that are those that are watching online. A shout out if my mother is watching today. She wasn't feeling so well yesterday, so wasn't sure if she would make it to church. So, Mom, I love you. And if you are watching, glad you're able to tune in. Who has Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2? Uh, I received that. Okay, hold on there just a moment. A microphone is coming your way. It's always nice to have Gordon and Cynthia when they're able to be with us. This is a paraphrased position. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Italy, Judah territory, this was during Herod's kingship. A band of scholars arrived in Jerusalem from the east. They asked around, where can we find to pay homage to the newborn king of the Jews? We observed the star in the eastern sky that signaled his birth, and we're on a pilgrimage to worship. Where there's so much in those two verses. So if anything that leaps out at you that you would like to comment on in those two verses or ask a question about, what stands out to you in those two verses? Yes. Well, I liked his um, version, how it said a band of scholars. And typically, they kind of get a bad, a bad rap in the Bible often, scholars. Mm -hmm. um, and I think... One reason is because they major in minors. I remember my dad kind of rolled his eyes sometimes because one of his friends would say, hey, you know what we talked about today? We get together and we just talk about deep things. Well, what did you talk about? Well, if God could make a boulder too big to lift. 
and you know, here are some scholars that they knew what to focus on. And I think sometimes they get a bad rap, but here they were intentional in finding this key. And so I think that was that's important to, to understand that here's some good guys who are scholars. Okay, what else? Mm -hmm. It amazes me that uh, the verse they used to match the star that they saw is just mentioned when it's prophecies about Jesus, that they included everything about this for me to be infused from that this one small text from one star they saw. And they must have really dove, dove into the uh, Jewish literature to come up with all this. It just made me have that one thing from the whole journey. Just they saw that one text. Yeah, how, how do they explain this to our, our how do they explain this to their wives? Uh, we're going on a trip. What well, kind of a trip? Well, it's a, you might call it a business trip. <laughs> Where are you going? Well, we don't know exactly. But several of us had a dream, and, and it might take us some distance, and we might be gone for quite a while. Oh, is this wise to do this? And anyway, it, it seems to me that the Holy Spirit must be impressing things on their hearts for them to set out on this journey. Anyone else like to comment on these verses? Yes, over here. Uh, I have a question which is less spiritual than the first two, but I still like to ask. Uh, within this and uh, within other version, I've never seen the number three, three wise men. Mm -hmm. no. uh, so I don't know if that was just from some speculations. You know, you talk about the, the dressing, right. I mean, uh, traveling from east might be very dangerous. I assume they came in band, not just three men. So, just, just a thought. well, the number three, we don't know, we know there were at least two because the, the plural is used. But could there have been 30 or 50? I, I don't know for sure. The number three comes from the gifts that they provide the gold, the frankincense, the myrrh. We'll say something about that. A little later, but that's her traditional number, and tradition has enriched it even more, or you might say lessened it even more. It has given names to them. They are Caspar and Melchior and Balthazar, and but, but we don't know their names. We don't know how many there were. We don't know exactly how far they came. If they came from Babylon and they traveled by the trade route, that would have been a journey of about. Are you ready for this? About eight hundred miles. And even if you're traveling on camelback, anybody here been on, on Mount Sinai before on, on, on a camel? If you're traveling on camelback, you only want to go a certain number of miles a day. <laughs> and so let's just say if they took, what, 20 to 25 miles a day, those would be pretty grueling days on, on camelback. You're talking about, what, 30 to 40 days, something like that, of travel. So they, they come from a long distance. Anything else on those verses that that leaps out at you? Uh, maybe just a word about the the magi, wise men. There's not one good English word that translates this word. The, the word in Hebrew is magi. That's where the term magi come from uh, comes from. They were philosophers, scholars, Astronomers. Now, when I use the term astrology, that has a bad connotation for us. That we, we think of superstition and, and somebody who does palm reading and that type of thing. But in that day and age, there were people who would have viewed what was happening in the heavens and they saw that it was connected with what was God was doing on the earth. In other words, they thought that there were signs in the heavens of what was taking place on earth. So kind of a combination of astrology and astronomy, but, but is led by God. And as Steve mentioned, you have this prophecy of Balaam that we won't take time to turn to, but if you want to look it up for your homework this afternoon, Numbers 24, 17, behold, there shall come a star out of Jacob, and it shall be shining out of Israel. And basically this was was indica an indicator to them that a ruler had been born, that a divinely appointed ruler was
was coming into the world. And so the prophecies of Balaam had evidently been handed down in this culture and perhaps also some prophecies from the prophet Daniel as well. So these are individuals who, while they don't have a, the, the access to the word of God as the Jews at Jerusalem had, they did have access to the impressions of the Holy Spirit who was leading them on a journey of the truth. Yes. I have a question. David Asherick uh, suggests that these men were um, not idolaters, that they were monotheistic. They served one, believed in one God. Mm -hmm. Is there any um, evidence of that or, or um, you know, that may have just been his opinion. I was just curious. Well, I mean, and, and it's harmless in some ways to engage in what we might call sanctified speculation. We don't know. Um, they, they do say we have come to worship him. And so evidently they're impressed that this is of, of great spiritual importance to them. And I think what I admire is even though they have only a limited knowledge of, of truth and of life, they follow the life that they have and it leads them, and we're going to talk about this first to Jerusalem and then it will lead them to Bethlehem. Uh, by the way, there's been a lot of speculation about what they saw in the sky and, and some astronomers have looked into this and there was a evidently some conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn and I think one other planet or so around BC, the year seven. Or some have wondered whether this was a, a comet. And I think Halley's comet appeared about maybe BC 10 or something along those lines. But, but I believe that what Desire of Ages says makes the most sense, that it was a shining company of angels. Because ultimately, it leads them to the house in which Jesus is in Bethlehem. And so I, I don't think it's worth spending a, a lot of time. What, what all was happening in the sky? Astronomy interests me. But what interests me more is how God is using these events to lead individuals to himself. Okay, who has our second reading? Matthew 2, verses 3 through 6. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them, where the Christ was to be born? So they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So here's a question for you. Why does God lead them to Jerusalem first? Because he, he, he could have led them to Bethlehem. I mean, he eventually does that. So why does he lead them to Jerusalem first before leading them to where the child is at Bethlehem? What do you think? I read in Desire of Ages that they were sent to Jerusalem so that the priests and the scribes had another opportunity to believe in Christ as a Savior and understand the scriptures as they had read them. Mm -hmm. So God is giving them an opportunity to, to respond, perhaps to, to join the Magi, the wise men, and going out to welcome the child. To the earth. So if, in case you're curious what Jerusalem would have looked like in the time of Jesus, it was quite a, a bustling place. This is a picture of Jerusalem. They would have been arriving from the east. What is just to the east of Jerusalem? I know Kenny has been there before. You have the, the Mount of Olives just to the east of Jerusalem. So maybe they're journeying down from the Mount of Olives, coming from the east, and of course the, the temple, the Temple Mount would have been very visible to their view. And a, a thriving city, and they arrive, and Desire of Ages has rather a sad phrase. It said they expected the news of the birth of the Messiah to be on every tongue. 
By the way, let me just uh, put in a plug for a couple of resources in addition to our, our Bible reading. If you haven't read Desire of Ages in some time, or even if you have, just there's such a wealth of material. In fact, I had to limit myself to a few memorable quotes that I'll come to at the end of our time today. But Desire of Ages, and then also a fairly new resource, Bill Johnson, who sadly passed away in the last year or so, wrote a book called Jesus of Nazareth, and it's an excellent accompaniment to our readings in the Gospels, and the desire of age is simply called Jesus of Nazareth, and I think it's probably available on Amazon. In fact, I think that's where I got my copy of it, Jesus of Nazareth. I have it here if you want to look at it after our class, but it's, it's well worth having. It has excellent material. But that's, that's a sense of what Jerusalem would have looked like when they arrived. And so the news reaches the palace of Herod that there are some strangers in town. Maybe we would say some, some wealthy strangers. They came in on camels. Uh, they look a bit different. They're from a foreign land, and they're wondering about the birth of a king. So how does Herod react? Well, he's, he's disturbed. We could talk about cruel old Herod. He, he was sort of like a Henry VIII before his time, if you looked into his uh, story. Had about five or six wives. He, he killed, had one of them executed. Uh, married a second one that had the same name as the first one. You know, you can contemplate in your mind whether that's wise or not. Uh, according to Josephus, he would walk the palace after he had his wife executed, calling out her name, clearly with somebody very disturbed, executed three of his sons, Antipater, Alexander, Aristobulus, causing Caesar to remark that it's better to be Herod's pig than his son, because Herod evidently followed the, the biblical dietary laws, and, and the idea is that if you were his pig, um, in Greek, pus, you would be safe, whereas if you were his son, Quios, sort of a pun, better to be his us than his Quios, that you, you were not so safe, because he, he had three of his sons executed, one, at least one of his wives, and so you can see how somebody like this is not going to be very tolerant of the news of somebody who has been born to be king. So what does he do? He calls the school of religion, <laughs> and ask the religious scholars, and what's his question? Where is the one to be born? Do they know the answer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, class, if I can confess to you, this is, this is Greg King's great fear from this story. And we're going to come down in the end, and we're going to ask you, it's a question I think that we should consider in connection with a number of biblical stories. Where am I in this story? But you think about it. They have arrived in Jerusalem. They, they start asking around. They expect the news of the Messiah's birth to be on every tongue, and no one seems to know anything about it. There's somebody arrived, and, and things like this happen at times. What if somebody arrive, arrives visiting the Seventh day Adventist church and they're excited about something they've discovered in scripture. They're excited about the second coming. And that day at church, have you used this term before? Well, it was a bad day for visitors to be there. <laughs> Maybe bring it a little closer to home for some of us. For myself, I'm speaking to my own heart. What if somebody arrives on the campus at Southern Adventist University? Brand new Christian, a new Seventh day Adventist, recently baptized, excited about what they have learned. What do they mean on campus? I'm asking myself. I'm asking us do, do, do they find people that are in love with Jesus Christ? And looking forward to welcoming his return to the earth? Or, or do we sometimes get so immersed 
and preoccupied and absorbed in, in activities that, and, and some of them are necessary. I get that. We go to our job each day. I, I give grades to my students at the end of the semester. I understand that. But what is the overriding passion in my life? What do people notice about me? Do they notice that I'm in love with Jesus Christ? I guess this is my fear for the new year, that I could be like one of those individuals who, they, they knew the memory verse. Do, do, do you catch that? That makes it even worse, doesn't it? Karen calls them, where's the Messiah to be for? Oh, it's right there in Micah chapter 5. You, Bethlehem, though you be little among the clans of Judah, out of you will come the ruler. They knew, but it made no difference. And so, what we see, as is the case a number of times in Scripture, the outsiders are the ones that are more receptive to truth, and the insiders are apathetic and indifferent and ignorant of what God wants to do. That's the great king fear for the new year. As I look at this story, they knew, but it didn't do them any good. Oh, and by the way, Desire of Ages says that they had heard the reports of the shepherds. And they treated it as unworthy of their notice. Sort of like somebody who's sitting in my classroom this coming semester. Hey, Professor King, I've been reading in the Bible and I'm really excited about Jesus coming again. And, and should I respond? Oh, well, you'll get over that excitement. You know, pretty soon you'll be lukewarm and they go to see him like I am. Is that what we May God help it not to be so. Okay, let's turn to our next passage, Matthew 2, 7 and 8. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. And let's go ahead while we're at it and do verses 9 through 12. Who has verses 9 through 12? Okay. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Okay, so what speaks to you from these verses, or what would you like to comment? You have Herod the schemer trying to, to find out where this child is, is so he can do him in. Um, the, the magi or wise men coming from afar and, and, and they, they bow down and worship. What, what speaks to you from these verses? Well, a couple things um, that come to my mind is that truth must be pursued. And these wise men they were undetoured in, in finding that. Um, you know, they had a little roadblock, a little, a little detour, and he met the king, but, but that did not keep them from mm -hmm. continuing on their, on their quest for truth. And then when they arrived, they still weren't um, detoured because it wasn't what they might have thought it would have been, a, a nice fancy schmancy house. It was kind of a dark little place, and uh, we don't know if it still was in the manger at this time or not. But anyway, it wasn't what they might have thought it should have been, and that and that still did not keep them from finding truth. And then when you are confronted with truth, it causes a response in you. And um, I'm just so moved by this, and also by the fact 
that Herod saw something in them that he knew these guys are going to pursue this. There's nothing that I can say that's going to make them give it up. He could see in them. These guys are relentless in their pursuit of truth. And so it says to me, I want that same, that same earnestness to reach out, to grab truth, to, to give my heart to Jesus every day. Mm-hmm. Good, good thoughts, uh, particularly when you think of their journey of 800 miles, perhaps. And I, I guess I find myself thinking sometimes we say, oh, you know, it's a little too far to travel those few miles, or it's raining today, or, or whatever, and I don't want to get out, and I'll just do church on Zoom, and, you know, excuse me if I'm striking a little close to home for some of you here, but, <laughs> but I, I really believe that God wants us to, to be in community with one another, and maybe one of the things we've learned from the last few years is that we need the community as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And, and so I would just uh, challenge you not to give in to those impulses about saying, oh, being online is the same thing. I can tell you our students know that it's not the same thing. <laughs> My wife is a support nurse will sometimes go into a room when let's say there's a, there was a student on an isolation and uh, maybe he has a teacher on on one computer screen and a computer game on on the other computer screen or something along those lines. It's easy to be distracted in this day and age. And, and I, I want to applaud you for coming together. Obviously, sometimes there are circumstances that whatever we're not able to get out. But, but uh, thank you, Bob, for facilitating this class. It's a, a rich blessing for Mary and me. We need the community that takes place on occasions like this. Yes, go ahead. It makes me think that since the wise men worshipped, uh, when they decided to come, I think the Holy Spirit had been speaking to their hearts in a powerful way, in mm-hmm. more than just like they got dreams to go not to go back to the heaven, yes. not to do this. The star, which was angels, I'm sure, came and was over Jerusalem. So they told the king and asked the people, where, where is this king that was born? And they're surprised nobody was in, interested. Ellen Mike said in the Desire of Ages that they had to travel at night because they were following the star. So in the day, they spent their time talking about his right. coming. And so it's such a beautiful story that as the as they continue to follow the spirits leading and the, the leading of the star, the angels, he keeps revealing to them more mm-hmm. and more so that they're the first ones who worshipped him, who worshipped him as the savior of the world. It's the most beautiful thing. shows that the Holy Spirit wants, and God and Jesus, want everyone saved. And so if you respond to the Spirit in a positive way and follow, he will keep you. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And and Yadar Vegas said, by the way, if you haven't read chapter six yet, that's your homework for this afternoon. Beautiful chapter, but it says they left Jerusalem less confident than when they entered because they arrived, the chosen people, the remnant people, weren't very excited about the coming of the Messiah. May, may that not be so of us. Yes. Good morning, sir. Uh, just had a question um, concerning the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Um, I just found out recently that they were, were healing, but were they not also used for funeral spices, indicating that the wise men knew that he would come and die for our sins, being that some of the confusion primarily previously was that the Messiah would come and take up arms as opposed to dying for our sin and convicting us that we did need a Savior. Yeah, th- thank you for bringing that up because... It does seem to me that it's worthy of notice. Now, I'm not sure all of the light that the wise men received as God was leading them there, what the Lord had revealed to them. But if you look at those three gifts, gold, in a sense, is the gift for a king. Uh, Frankincense was used by the priest in sacrifice. Incense at the temple. Of course, Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. He, according to Hebrews, is our high priest. And then myrrh is something that was used for embalming the dead. And so, in a sense, they're preparing Jesus for what will take place in the future. And, of course, the gospel writer, when he's recording that, he knows what eventually 
will happen to Jesus when he's recording that later on. And so you have the gift for a king, the gift for a priest, and also the gift for one who will suffer and die on behalf of his people. It's a beautiful point. Thank you for making that. Okay, let's turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And by the way, of course, there's more things that you could spend time with in, in Matthew chapter 2, the, the so-called slaughter of the infants. It, it's, a, it's a terrible story. Some have wondered whether this is actually true or not, because they said, well, we don't have it recorded in secular history. What we know about Herod would suggest to me that he would have no qualms at all, would not have a second thought about killing the children of Bethlehem, that there have been estimates ranging from about 10 to about 35 children of Bethlehem that would have been age two and under. But even if it's only one, if that is your child, to, to have that child, and if any of you have toured the Vatican Museum in Vatican City, Sometimes you, you find these artists of the Renaissance that had a fascination with this scene of the slaughter of the infants, and, and you have these children being ripped from their mother's arms and the mother's whole, it, it's, it's a sad scene. And so obviously that those scenes of brokenness, like the ones we were talking about at the beginning of the lesson, they play their way out in Matthew chapter 2. But I do want to take some time to consider Jesus' visit as a boy to the temple. And who has Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 45? Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. So have you ever lost your child before? <laughs> you can have recriminations, and, oh, why did I do that? Why did I leave him there? Joni and my aunt and uncle, one time they were traveling from Florida back to their home in Michigan. And, and they, they were wonderful parents. They loved their children, but this kind of thing can happen. They were driving in a van and their, their youngest, their son was sleeping in the back. And so they stopped to fill up with gas and, and take care of a few things and whoever needs to go to the restroom and so forth. He had been sleeping in the back unbeknownst to them. He woke up and went in to use the restroom and comes back out, and this was in the day and age before cell phones. And uh, so they took off. They were 20 miles down Interstate 75 or so, and state patrol pulls up next to them. And, we have your son. <laughs> you can imagine how embarrassing that is. Well, it, 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 I guess maybe there's, uh, it saves you some anxiety and gray hairs if you don't know that your child is missing. But think about Jesus. It, when he was a child, his parents knew that the leader in Jerusalem wanted to wipe him out, to execute him. <laughs> so the Bible says that they go up as was their custom. Now, by the way, a little, this is a little Bible lesson here. This is our, our life and teachings of Jesus class for today. It says the parents went up as it was their custom. What else does it say in the same gospel, the gospel of Luke? that Jesus had a custom of doing. Anybody remember? What do you think of the verse that Jesus went into the synagogue, Luke chapter 4, as was his custom. So it was the custom of his parents to go up to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. Now, you notice in the Bible, it doesn't say whether Jesus had been going up with them or whether he was left at home prior to this, but he's at the dividing line between childhood and manhood in Jewish society. He's arrived at his 12th year, 
and still today among our Jewish friends, when the boy reaches 12, or it may be actually on his, what we call his 13th birthday, he has a what? A bar mitzvah. Or with a young lady, it's a bat mitzvah. And it's a time of, of celebration, a time of welcoming them in a new way. By the way, maybe there's some things, some lessons we can learn about this. Sometimes, I don't know if our baptisms are as special as they, they should be. It should be a meaningful time, right? For the family, and for the church family. And we, we join together and, and some, some special gifts for the person to remember this time. Well, his parents go up to Jerusalem at the Feast of the Passover, and they take him up, again, perhaps his first time since he was a, a baby. We don't know for sure, but this time he goes up with them. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, what does it say in verse 43? The boy Jesus what? He stayed behind in Jerusalem. Now, what we're going to see from the story is while on Jesus' part, this was evidently intentional to stay behind. It wasn't intentional for his parents. And you might ask some questions. How could this have happened? How did they leave Jerusalem? Well, let me just suggest a couple of possibilities. We don't know for sure. Is it possible that the, the men and women traveled in somewhat separate groups, a little separated from one another. And perhaps Joseph still thinks of Jesus as a little boy, and he assumes that, that Jesus is with Mary and the smaller children. Mary thinks, oh, well, he's, he's 12 now. And so he is going to be traveling with the men. He's arrived at this time. His bar mitzvah has taken place. And so he's traveling with the men. And, and can you imagine a conversation in your mind? They arrive at the place where they're camping. Let's call it a campground of America, right? A, a KOA. They arrive at the place they're staying the first evening. And Joseph and Miriam, maybe there was a little tension in the conversation. Is that possible? Joseph says to Mary, hey, where's Jesus at? I haven't seen him today. Oh, I thought he was... With you. Oh, he hasn't been with me. I thought he was with you. Interestingly enough, desire they just said they missed his his helping presence, his cheerful helping presence when it was time to do the chores at the end of the first day. And so they start talking, and can you imagine how frantic they are? He's nowhere to be found. We can't find him. And it would have been difficult, probably the evening shadows had, had settled in, and so they, they journeyed one day away from Jerusalem, maybe 20 miles away. The next day, they have to go back, and let's look at verses 46 through 50, who has those verses? Yes. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Okay, so where do they find him? And when we say they found him in the temple, Let's keep in mind that the temple, and this is basically the temple complex in the time of Jesus. By the way, who was the king that, that was humanly responsible for the building of this great structure in New Testament times was Herod. This is, this is Herod's temple. They had taken a, a smaller structure and basically enlarged the platform. And, and so it was a whole complex of rooms 
and, and structures and walls and buildings. And so to, to say that they found him at the temple is not as simple as thinking that they came into the church sanctuary in fact. It would be like maybe finding somebody on the Southern Adventist University campus or something like that. They could be anywhere. And so they find him at the temple and he's in a, a room somewhere, maybe off to the side somewhere, and he's interacting with the religious leaders. Okay, what speaks to you from these verses that we've read about his parents searching for him, the boy Jesus being there with the religious leaders and scholars and interacting with them? Yes. I, I think he called it sanctified speculation. Yes. But I, as I was reading and studying this week, I just felt like that Jesus had reached a different point in his life. Like you said, he's 12 mm -hmm. years old now. That's the time of adulthood. And it might have just been the first time that he was able to go in with these leaders. Mm -hmm. and, and I think he was fascinated by it. And they, in turn, were fascinated by him. And time just got away from them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. What else? Yes, Gordon. Time got away from them for three days. <laughs> I mean, that just that's my question. I'm going to wait for him for three days. What did he do for three days? Well, I think that he has been interacting with them, at least in part. But in Desire of Ages, it also talks about it. And there's a beauty in this. And this is one of the points I want us to take away. That, that Jesus is reflecting and meditating on these services that take place at the temple. And, and you recognize when he says, and it can be translated in various ways, uh, in this case, the King James might be a little closer to being accurate than some of our current translations. More of the current translations will say something like, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? The, the, the term house is not there in the Greek. The King James, and maybe some of you learned this as a memory verse when you were young, wist ye not that I must be what? about my father's business. In other words, I'm on my father's schedule. I'm on God's time frame. And this is what deeply moves me about this passage. I want you to think about it for a moment. It's one thing to think of the adult Jesus committing himself to you, to me. I will die for Greg King. I don't want to be in heaven without Greg King, without Myron, without Bob Hamilton. I, I want him there in heaven. It's one thing for an adult to say that. To have a 12-year-old boy look at a lamb being sacrificed, and, and there's the, the growing awareness that this lamb represents me, that, that I am going to one day fulfill what is taking place at the temple, that, that all of this in some ways is a foreshadowing of my life, and I'm going to be committed. I'm surrendering myself to follow God's plan for my life. To think about a 12-year-old boy making that commitment. That's staggering for me to think about that. Hurry. I'm going to go back just a few texts and just the whole thing of them discovering him missing. And um, the New American Standard Version says um, but his parents were unaware of it, but supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey and again looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt like this is this little passage that gives us a little glimpse into the personality of Jesus, that he was social. Mm -hmm. And they were like, he's with friends or he's with our relatives. Right. I had thought of it, you know. The separation between the family when they were traveling. I've never thought of that before, but I always thought of it as them expecting him to be enjoying friends and family. Yes. Um, that nicely stated. And Desire Rachel mm -hmm. makes the point that his playmates, if we want to call them that, I mean, I mean let's recognize that in Desire of Ages, and this fits in with scripture, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Think of Jesus learning to use a modern day equivalent, tie his shoes, learning the difference between left and right, or, or whatever it might be, learning to read from his mother and, and, and so forth. And Desire of Ages says that Jesus' playmates like to have him around. I'm paraphrasing here. They found him a little different, but they enjoyed having him around. And, and Desire of Ages says everyone was happier for his presence, even the beast 
a burden because he would stop and you can picture him, oh yeah, you're a cute little kitty cat or something along those lines. And, and so Jesus was a cheerful child and yet he makes this commitment to surrender his life to the glory of God. I, I just find that to be a staggering thought. Yes. Uh, you actually touched base on this. Um, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And being he is a 12 year old boy at this time, and he has to be baptized, and he's, he's gained that mm -hmm. wisdom and knowledge um, from the other priests. This to me speaks of he wasn't speaking from authority, but the beginning that they were realizing he was with authority. Yes, yes, yes. Nicely stated. Yes, back to that. I also heard a pastor say one time that what this first morning they did not connect with Jesus and it took them three days to find him. Mm -hmm. And I think in our own life, you know, we need to connect every single day, all day long, so that we keep that connection and not lose it and then have to scramble to find it. You have beautifully paraphrased one of the quotes from Desire of Ages that I'm about to, to review. I, I do want you to notice the contrast. Have you heard before of some, some Gospels that are false Gospels and not found in the Bible? There's one called the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. And I want you to notice the contrast that it presents with the Biblical Gospel. In the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, Jesus makes clay birds. Think of somebody, a child, playing with Play-Doh and claps his hands and, and they come to life miraculously lengthened a piece of wood in the carpenter's, carpenter's shop. I think Joseph was making a bed and, and one of the planks was not long enough. And Jesus said, oh, I'll take care of this. Anybody ever watched the old show Bewitched or And, and uh, Jesus says, I'll take care of this. Kills a child by cursing him when he accidentally bumps into Jesus. Oh, you bump into me on the basketball court? I'll take care of you. When the neighbors complain, Jesus strikes them blind. Now, do you notice this portrait of Jesus that is not biblical, that's found in the, the false gospels? If you've heard of Gnosticism before, and we've mentioned it in class, it probably comes out of Gnosticism, this gospel. They picture Jesus using his divine power for his own amusement, for his own benefit, and to bring curses on others. This is not the biblical picture, is it? The biblical picture is of the Jesus who develops normally in childhood, though recognizing he has a special mission and a special call, but he has placed, he has set aside the independent use of his miraculous powers. In other words, he is not accessing this power on his own behalf, he's going to only use it to benefit others, to be bless a blessing to others. Let's look at a couple of quotes that I think are worth requoting <coughs> for this, and then I want to call our attention to a couple of takeaways. And a few of these, they, they, they speak pretty strongly to us in this day and age, so, so brace yourself, okay? Put your seatbelt on. The more quiet and simple the life of the child, the more free from computer game. Oh, says artificial excitement. <laughs> and by the way, this isn't just talking about children, is it? The more free from artificial excitement and the more in harmony with nature, the more favorable is it to physical and mental vigor and to spiritual strength. I wonder if we made a commitment to God in this new year that, that maybe we reach for our electronic gadgets a little less and for the word of God a little more. Just say something to think about. Look at this one. Isn't this a striking quote? Jesus was doing God's service just as much when laboring at the carpenter's bench is when working miracles for the multitude. Isn't that stunning? Sometimes we have people that arrive on campus, and of course we, we welcome people to, to campus who want to study for ministry and for theology, but, but God has not called everyone 
to be a full-time pastor. There are sometimes individuals that, that God, what God wants them to do is use their talents and ability to serve him faithfully in the context where they are. Are you following me with this? And, and I believe that we are, if we are following God's plan for our lives, we are serving him just as fully as Jesus was when out teaching and working miracles for the multitude. Another one, this is the one that Becky referred to just a moment ago. By one day's neglect, speaking of Joseph and Mary, they what? They lost the Savior, but it cost them three days of anxious search to find him. So with us, by idle talk, evil speaking, or neglect of what? Now, like the prayer, we may in one day lose the Savior's presence, and it may take many days of sorrowful search to find him and regain the peace that we have lost. And then one more, and, and Bob, my own suggestion, and uh, somebody else, Peruski, is teaching next week, so he can choose his own thing, but I, I, I actually believe that this paragraph, or particularly the first sentence, would be a wonderful theme for our entire study of the life of Christ. What does it say? It would be well for us to spend what? A thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each thing. Sometimes people say, well, you know, that's that's not found in the scripture. That's found in your imagination. Well, if the imagination is not going contrary to scripture, I believe that we should contemplate. How did Joseph and Mary respond to one another? Did Joseph want to punish Jesus when he first found him again at the temple? Did they stand there for a little while and listen to what Jesus was saying? Did the conversation go something like this? Maybe one of the learned rabbis was saying, well, the Messiah is going to come and reign as, the, reign as king and show that the Jews are his people and, and that they will be exalted over all the earth. And the 12-year-old boy raises his hand and says, well, what about Isaiah 53? which says he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. And the rabbi that had just commented says, well, um, I think maybe my learned friend would like to answer that question. Pass the buck. And then somebody says, well, you know, we'll have a little more time to discuss this tomorrow <laughs> when we gather back together. Is it possible that Jesus, in his knowledge and learning, gave evidence of an understanding of Scripture that was far superior to what the religious leaders were exhibiting that day. Is it possible that, that this is God giving them another opportunity to be impacted by the truth of his word? Is it possible, think about this, that some of those same leaders that were there when the boy Jesus was interacting with them at the temple, think about it, it's only... 18 years later that Jesus is 33 and is put up on a cross. Is it possible that Nicodemus, the man who came to Jesus by night, was one of those religious leaders and, and those things percolate in his mind for a number of years? God is giving them an opportunity to be impacted by truth, to be confronted with truth. Is that possible? That they always remembered that little boy who had in it knowledge of scripture and intimate acquaintance with it that far exceeded their own knowledge. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant. Our love will be quickened. We shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit if we would be what? Saved at last. Saved at last. We must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. Isn't that true? That first sentence, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. So here are the great king takeaways from these stories. I'm happy for you to come up 
with your own. First of all, where am I in these stories? Isn't that what we should ask as we read the stories of Scripture? Where do I fit in? You know, you read about the people at the cross, and I, the thief next to Jesus. Am I one of the ones wanting to keep my distance from him? Am I drawing as close to him as I can, like the disciple John? Where am I in these stories? A religious leader, a, a magi, a wise man, someone else. Have I reflected on the commitment of the boy Jesus to following God's plan for his life? You can tell that it's, that has impressed me this week. A 12-year-old lad saying, I am going to follow God's plan. I'm surrendering my life to God. Isn't that moving? It is wonderful to have a 12-year-old lad commit himself to following God's plan, whatever the cost. Am I willing to surrender myself entirely to God in this new year? And then I'd like to just read Luke 2, 51 and 52. Who had that? I think that was the sign of someone. There we go. Let's read that in the back. Luke 2, 51 and 52. Then he went down the hill to Nazareth, and was subject to him. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor of God and man. Now, two quick thoughts on that. It may seem like a little brief passing reference where it says his mother, that's Mary, pondered all these things in her heart. The same phrase was used in Luke 2.19. Is this suggesting to us that maybe Mary is the source for these stories in Luke 1 and 2? I think so. Is it possible that Luke, later in Mary's life, talks to her? Isn't there something that's moving about Mary remembering, reflecting? Well, we went up to the temple. The angel Gabriel appeared to me. I remember. I went to Jesus, and I said, why did you do this to us? And you know what he said. Can you picture Mary telling Luke these stories? And then Luke records them for us in Scripture. It says, Mary pondered all these things. In her heart. And then Luke 2.52, a number of you learned this as a memory verse when you were young. Let's say it together. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. But don't just let those words be empty words. Jesus grew how? Mentally? Physically? Socially? Spiritually? And so I would ask, I ask myself, I ask you, do I have some goals in these areas for the new year? And then, of course, question. You notice I use the word goals instead of resolutions. <laughs> resolutions can be easily broken. Steps to Christ has a memorable phrase that says, our human promises, you may know what it says, ropes of sand. A rope of sand is not going to bind anything very firmly, is it? So, so I use the word goals. <laughs> Do I have some goals in these areas for the new year? And then the probing question, what am I doing to accomplish these goals? And I can't think of a better goal for any of us than to resolve to be like the wise man who came and worshipped him. To resolve to be like the shepherds who, who came and recognized that this was the king of kings to resolve to spend time with him on a regular and ongoing basis. May God help us to that end. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, we've covered some magnificent stories. We've seen how those magi came from afar and the people they expected to have a knowledge of you, they were indifferent, they were apathetic. They ignored the opportunity they had to respond to truth. And so it was the, the foreigners who would have been considered pagans who, who brought their gifts to you in worship. Lord, as people of the church, may we not be like those religious leaders. And then we think of the boy Jesus going to the temple at age 12. And how he grew in wisdom and stature, favor with God and man. 
by your grace and through your transforming power, may we grow closer to you in this new year. May we not lose sight of you. May we spend time with you on a daily basis. In the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, we pray. Amen. God bless you in this new year. God bless you.